Okay, so let's get going. Um, actually, I, I wanted to start with a very quick uh, announcement. I got an email this morning from uh, Anna Watts uh, saying that there was a poll on Canvas that uh, she invited you to about uh, essentially the uh, Block 4 third year courses on the FU campus for year 2021. Uh, so that seems to concern you, and she said that only 34 of 82 students in the cohort have voted. So there you go. Uh, deadline is 9 a.m. Thursday morning. So either you do it Wednesday night or early Thursday morning. So uh, message, uh, message given. Um, okay. So uh, uh, also I received a couple of emails from uh, people asking when the solutions to week one would finally be put online. So I, I was prom promised that everything would be checked today and that that would be put uh, on Canvas later today. So we're trying to keep up a bit. So we put some attention on the latest problems recently, but this should come up uh, 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 within the rest of uh, today. And also hopefully today we'll put the problems also for you to work on until the next uh, uh, exercise session on, uh, on Monday, okay? Um, so last time we were kind of carrying on with our horse race through uh, electrostatics. Essentially, I want to uh, uh, continue that uh, today. Today I want to start with uh, chapter three, essentially. Uh, so the idea of chapter three is that we're actually going to talk a bit more about uh, uh, methods for uh, here. I could write, uh, for example, uh, 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 guessing, uh, uh, you know, or just calculating the electrostatic uh, potential and any other method you can you can think of okay so um, let me just uh, remind you a little bit about uh, uh, what the kind of challenge is the first bit is going to be just a little mathematical because we have to be precise in what we do um, so just uh, to, to start again from where we were we had some fundamental equations Okay, so first of all, we, we have a fundamental equation to go from a charge distribution in space to a, an, electrical, an electric field in space. And the idea of this is that we would just compute, essentially deriving from you know, Coulomb's law, we would compute the uh, electric potential as a volume integral if we have a volume charge distribution. And because of linearity, we just do the integral over, uh, uh, over all our space. Uh, maybe, maybe this is R cubed. Uh, maybe this is just a, like a compact manifold within this. It doesn't really matter. We have our volume integral, and we have the charge density at the source point, uh, R prime. And then you remember our way of writing this. This was really the 1 over R squared, but with vector directions. So the way we write this is essentially the vector R minus R prime itself divided by the cube of it. Okay, so this is really something that you can use explicitly. If I give you a charge distribution, then you are able to calculate the electric field coming from it. Um, we could also uh, compute uh, uh, from uh, rho of r, uh, something which allows us to compute the electrical field, but, you know, which is maybe a little bit more high level. It's the electrostatic potential, V of r, and this V, which is now a scalar, as a function of the vector position, it's exactly the same integral, but with you know a different uh, different power here. So one over four pi um, epsilon zero uh, integral over d tau prime of rho at r prime, okay, over r r cubed. But now it's really just one over the distance, okay. So one over uh, r minus r prime. Okay, so typically, of course, calculating the integrals involved in the potential are, uh, you know, simpler than the ones for the, for the field, so that's usually a good trick. Okay, now these are kind of global formulations uh, uh, of uh, uh, relations for the, for the potential. We had seen that uh, if we look locally at our things, then um, we have the Poisson equation. Which relates the Laplacian of V okay, um, to the local charge density, rho over epsilon zero. Okay, so this is all a function of R. And then if rho is zero, that is in the 
real space, in, in the free space part, and kind of vacuum part of it, then we get uh, Laplace, who is the most famous, because he's got the simplest uh, equation, and the simplest you are, the more famous you are. So the Laplace equation just tells you that the Laplacian of the scalar potential vanishes if there is no local charge. That's a zero, right? Yes. Not uh, smiling. Okay, so what I would like to do today is just discuss a little bit uh, the, the, the nature of the solutions to the Laplace equation, and then we'll discuss some methods to, uh, to compute this. But I, mean, I think you already know many of these things. I just want maybe to be a little bit more mathematically precise than you've been uh, until now. Okay? So, let's, uh, uh, let's uh, discuss essentially just Laplace, because it's so simple, it's the starting point. So, um, what are the uh, simplest situations that we can consider? Well, first of all, <clears throat> if we do things in one dimension, then things are almost trivial, because what we're saying is that the second derivative of v as a function of some position x with respect to the position, that this is equal to zero. But you see, the absolutely, completely general solution to this is just a, a linear function. It just tells us that v of x is equal to you know, some, uh, uh, some constant times x plus some other constant. Okay? Um, and that's it. You know, it's the, uh, the, uh, the most general solution you can write down for this. Uh, uh, this is quite trivial. Okay? And you can state some properties that will actually generalize to higher dimensions. So it's useful to, to state those. So properties. Okay. Um, there's, uh, there's one nice little one, and here I'm kind of following the, uh, uh, the presentation in Griffiths because it's like uh, uh, useful for other things. Um, so at any position, okay, uh, V is the average v of x plus a plus v of x minus a for any a. Okay? This is kind of a funny property. You'd think, of course, locally it kind of works, because if I take two little points right next to the point that I want to consider, then it's going to work. But here, because of the linearity of the solution, this is true irrespective of the actual displacement that you're considering. Okay? Um, so that's one of the properties here, and it really immediately comes from the explicit solution here. A second thing you can say <coughs> um, is that the solution to Laplace has no local minimum or maximum. Okay, so if you were to draw a function uh, like uh, this here in 1D and ask me whether it was a solution to Laplace equation, then immediately I can tell you no. Of course, you can see it from this, but <coughs> it's, uh, uh, you know, it's good to be able to visualize this thing. So what does it mean, right? It really means that the solution has absolutely no curvature whatsoever. So anything that has essentially a hump in it in 1D will not be a solution to the Laplace equation. Okay, so that's a very, very simple situation. I'll come back to the 1D case later when we talk about uh, boundary conditions and uniqueness uh, uh, of the solutions. Okay? So that's one, uh, uh, one statement here. Now we can just make it a little bit more complicated and let's go to two dimensions. <clears throat> In that case, we're going to take V to be a function of X and Y. But the second derivatives with respect to uh, x plus the second derivative with respect to y um, is equal to 0. Now, this is a little bit more non-trivial. And we'll see later when we discuss the method of separation of variables that this actually leads to many, many non-trivial solutions that do have slices, if you want, that do have local humps. Okay. Um, however, before we get to those details, we can also state a number of simple properties of this. 
which again derive from a higher dimensional generalization of this. So uh, the first property is very similar to the first property here. Okay. <clears throat> so v at a point uh, x and y, um, it's really uh, uh, equal to the average value around that point. So you do a uniformly weighted average around some uh, uh, some ball around the, the point x and y, and you will get the same thing. So so equals uh, uh, the average value. around the point uh, x, y. Okay, so the way you would write this is you would say that uh, v at x and y is really the average over the, uh, uh, the you know, little circle uh, around this. So you choose, you choose a little circle, 2 pi r. And then you do an integral um, around this, you know, you do an integral around this uh, 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 this uh, this circle of the value of v on this circle, and then it's the same thing. Okay, so again, if you want, you can switch the value around this circle, but whatever you add somewhere, you'll have to lose somewhere else in order to uh, 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 to fulfill this uh, this condition. Okay, and again, uh, this um, uh, this second property here uh, also generalizes. So uh, so v has no local max or min. Okay, and here, understand what I mean by this. I really mean not a maximum in one of the directions. I mean a maximum or a minimum in both directions, that it was like a hump, okay, the summit of a mountain. It's not there. Because why? I mean, if you look at the summit of a mountain, you take two directions, and then, essentially, the second derivatives have to uh, be greater than zero or less than zero. Question. So points of inflection and saddle points are allowed. Saddle points are allowed. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. So if you have if you have a configuration where actually one goes like this and one goes like this, then this is okay, because I can have a second derivative which is positive in this direction and then negative in this direction here. So the physical meaning of what I'm saying here is that there's no stable point where the derivatives, the curvature in all directions is greater than zero. If you have one direction in which the curvature is negative, then you can do whatever you want with the other directions. But if you were to put a particle there, it would not be stable because a little perturbation in the direction of the negative curvature direction would lead you to, uh, 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 to fall off. Right? And we'll see that later when we discuss the, the solutions, but that's the kind of property. I'll give you a theorem also that's uh, related to this, just after I say the uh, 3D case. Okay? So that's it. <clears throat> and then, uh, so finally, we could kind of carry on uh, like this for, uh, uh, for ages. Uh, let's do three dimensions, and then, you know, generalize to n, but we won't really need more than three dimensions. So three dimensions. Um, what we're saying is that the whole uh, Laplacian of uh, V is equal to zero. And once again, uh, properties, same thing. So, uh, so V of R is average of V on ball centered on R. Okay, so what's, what I mean with this is the just v at r is equal to just 1 over uh, 4 pi uh, r squared, which is going to be the surface of our ball. And now what I'm doing is really a, a surface integral, uh, dA, of v on that surface. Okay? And the, so that's the first one. And the second property is that, once again, v has no local min or max, OK? Uh, and if you want the, uh, uh, the kind of conundrum here, so the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the min max values, uh, 
They can only occur at the boundaries. Okay, because of course we're now looking at the solution for the electrostatic potential inside a vacuum, but this vacuum might be confined by some walls, some conductors, some you know, surface charges or whatnot. <clears throat> and of course, at those points, it could be that your function is uh, maximal or minimal. But in the bulk, uh, uh, it's not. Okay, so these are very, very simple uh, statements uh, with this. Now, in the notes, I, I kind of give you a, a, a bit of a way of uh, seeing this. So it's a way of seeing this. I mean, I know it's kind of obvious, but it's still worth, uh, uh, worth stating. So, uh, so let's just change the uh, notations a, a little bit. What we're going to do is consider our function v of r. And I'm going to take three orthogonal directions, x, y, z. And I'm going to consider the second derivatives in these directions as being three different functions. So this function here, it's a function fx of r, okay? And then same for y and z. So I have three functions, fx, fy, fz, which are functions of the position vector. And what I know is that these three functions have to add up to zero. So I have to I have to have this relationship for any point R in which Laplace holds, OK? Now, um, so what would be the uh, characteristic of an extremum of R? Uh, sorry, an uh, extremum of, of V, right? Well, what it would mean is that um, uh, I, could, um, I could write the gradient of V times a little displacement to be equal to zero for any, di for any displacement. You know this notation, yeah? For any delta R. Okay? So I have my three-dimensional space. I consider my function v at that point. And now I'm going to take little vectors going in all possible directions. And I will compute the change in v, which is just the gradient of v dotted into the displacement that I'm making. Question. What's the third word? Uh, I'm sorry. So it's not even a word. Yeah. Or, yeah, or this one. Extremum. Extremum. Oh, yeah. Okay. Characteristic of extremum of v. Yeah, sorry, it's a bit cryptic. Are you getting used to my handwriting by now? A little bit. Yeah, okay, good. Um, you should take measurements, you know, plot uh, like uh, this one's maybe. Uh, I, I promise you the, uh, the exam will not be handwritten. Yeah, uh, we'll do it uh, cleanly. Um, okay, um, so that's the, uh, that's the idea of an extremum, right? So it means that for any displacement that I have, then I would essentially not change the value of the function because to linear order, I could write this change of value as the gradient dotted into the displacement, and this would have to, to vanish. Okay, uh, now, so condition for a local minimum the condition for a local minimum is that um, I want to have the second derivative greater than zero. I want to have like the, the full curvature of this thing greater than zero. But then in general, what I would, uh, what I would write is a summation over all my possible uh, directions. I would compute the second derivative of my function with respect to one of the coordinates or the other. Let me then write them as ri uh, rj. What I mean with ri is x, y, or z depending on i, okay? And then I would have a little displacement delta ri, delta rj. And the point is that to have a local minimum, I should have these things here be strictly greater than zero, okay? It's just looking at the change of the thing. The bottom of the basin would be such that 
first derivative is zero, but second derivative would be positive. Okay, again, in all different directions, and if my directions are like uh, uh, are orthogonal, I can write it like this. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, doing step by step. So along uh, x, then y, then uh, z. Um, we would need that the second derivative of v with respect to x with the delta x squared be greater than 0. We would need the second derivative of v with respect to y with the displacement along y squared to be greater than 0. And the same thing with z. Okay, But these are just the functions I had defined, right? So, so this is just uh, uh, fx, fy, <coughs> fz. But that means that, essentially, I need these um, three things here to all be greater than 0. Okay, so that don't work. And that's proper English. I meant, uh -huh. Okay, so you see it, it, it doesn't work because I have to pay the cost somewhere. Yeah, so if two of them are positive, then if I want to have a global minimum, also in the third direction, I would need to be positive. <coughs> but Laplace tells me that that's no go. Okay. So that leads us to a, a famous statement, which is called Earnshaw's theorem, E-A-R-N-S-H-W, Earnshaw's theorem. Okay. <clears throat> um, so uh, it is not possible. Uh, to find um, uh, an electrostatic potential in which a point charge is stably held. Okay, and that's great about these, uh, these theorems here because you can reformulate them in your own words and, uh, and whatnot. They all mean the same thing. Okay? So there's no way in hell that I'm going to give you a point charge and tell you to use electrostatic potentials to hold that thing in place. That doesn't work. Okay? It's not possible. And then, you know, maybe uh, the people among you with an imagination would kind of go, ah, but hang on. You know, uh, we have crystals, we have matter. This is not held together by, you know, uh, propagating currents or whatnot. A crystal is held together by electrostatic forces. Yet it is stable. If I were to move my little atom in the middle of a big matrix, of a big crystal, this atom would not go. Okay? So I will let you to uh, ponder why, why this works. Maybe later I will ask you questions also to make you think about that. We'll, we'll get back to this point later. But you see, it's a bit mysterious. So when you come across that, first of all, you might actually worry about the stability of matter. But it's okay. The world survived after Earnshaw formulated this. Yeah, nothing collapsed. It could have happened. But it is not the case. Okay? But you see, there's a bit of a mystery here. So we'll get back to this uh, later. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what I would like to do um, is uh, uh, essentially make a mathematical statement about solutions to uh, Laplace's equation. In the book of Griffiths, there's a whole section about um, 
essentially uh, uh, theorems for the uh, uniqueness of uh, solutions. Let's just discuss that a little bit. So, so the question we can ask <coughs> are essentially um, um, so so um, what are the conditions under which we can find a unique solution so a unique solution to the poisson I'll do poisson but of course that includes Laplace as a case Okay, and we'll try to give a very precise answer to this question. Okay, and now we're essentially doing like a, a little bit of mathematics. Okay, um, I don't know if you got the, the notes from, uh, from Canvas because I, I put them up uh, last week. Did, did, did any of you already read the notes? So if I say like George Green, can you tell me who that was? Anybody? One person. <laughs> very good, yes? Yes, yes. Pretty cool story, no? I mean, if you if you look at it, so uh, uh, so I will essentially give you the statement about uh, 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 about the solutions here, about the uniqueness based on a result of George Green. Now we said so. George Green was this uh, Miller uh, uh, in you know, like the north of England, and he uh, uh, qualified to become an undergraduate at the age of forty uh, in Cambridge. Uh, and then he died at the age of 47. Rumor has it that he just like discovered drinking uh, in, uh, uh, in Cambridge, which I, I think many people do, but uh, that's the way it is. Um, but before that, actually out of absolutely nowhere, he had no formal education, he published a kind of essay. And that essay was like um, absolutely spectacularly well thought out, uh, a brilliant set of results that essentially nailed completely the way you should think about the solution of these uh, equations in electrostatics, but then also in electrodynamics that we'll see later. So I, I just want to present a couple of things uh, from George Green and then use those to discuss the, uh, uh, the solutions to uh, Poisson's equation. Okay, so here it goes. So little, little sidetrack, okay? So Green's identities. Okay, and you'll see these, uh, these kind of come um, out of nowhere, but they're extremely useful. So what we're going to do is we're going to start from the divergence theorem. Okay, so what we're saying is that the, the integral in a certain volume of the divergence of some <coughs> now vector function f this is going to be equal to the surface integral on the surface surrounding this volume here of this vector function dotted into the normal uh, vector uh, around the surface. Okay? So this holds for any differentiable vector function f. Okay? Now we're just going to uh, 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 put f to be a specific thing. I'm going to tell you that this function f I will take to be a product of a scalar function with the gradient of another scalar function. But I'm not telling you what these are. It doesn't matter what they are. Once again, they're just like uh, 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 smooth functions of spatial position. So <clears throat> what we can do is just use uh, the little identity, if I were to compute the divergence of this, uh, of this f here, phi grad psi, okay, and maybe, uh, so, so what is this? Well, it's a product of two things. So first of all, I can let the differentials act on psi, so then I get phi with the divergence, the, sorry, the Laplacian of psi, plus then just the dotted gradients of the two functions, grad phi dotted into grad psi. 
Okay, again, don't ask me what these functions are. They're, they're just functions. It doesn't matter. We're just like deriving an identity. We're like cooking things that are already uh, known. Okay. Um, and what we can also write is that um, uh, phi with the grad psi, okay, uh, when that is dotted into the normal vector to the, to the surface, the way we're going to write this is just as phi and d psi dn, where n now, if you want, is the coordinate, which is just like perpendicular to the surface. Okay, so if I have a plane like this, then it's just z. Okay, just a notation. So simple substitution. <clears throat> it gives uh, Green's first identity. Okay, which tells you that the integral over a certain volume um, of some function with the Laplacian of another plus the dotted gradients grad phi dot grad psi okay that this whole thing is equal to the integral over the surface bounding the volume of just um, phi d psi dn. Okay, so, so it's great. You just manipulate simple things that you already know, and you become world famous. Yeah? And you start when you're a miller and things, and that's, uh, that's what happens. But it's true. Okay? Um, so, so this is the one we're going to use uh, later. Actually, maybe I could even give it a number, uh, 3.9 in the notes. Okay, maybe for future reference, <clears throat> you can just um, um, this plus the case where you just switch psi for phi and subtract. The results, you get Green's uh, second identity, um, which just tells you that the integral over a certain volume, d tau, of uh, phi with the Laplacian of psi minus psi the Laplacian of phi. Uh, this is just equal to the integral on the surface, dA, of the difference of the uh, right-hand side that we had before, phi d psi dn minus psi d phi dn. Okay, so this second identity we're not going to use today, but we might use it in the future. It's just a, a kind of handy um, uh, thing before. Okay, so I'm just giving you a mathematical statement. You couldn't write that down without thinking about it, but you can easily kind of derive it. Okay, <clears throat> so why is this useful? Okay. What I want to discuss now is uniqueness of the solution to the Poisson equation. So uniqueness of solution to Poisson. <clears throat> okay, so suppose that we have two solutions. That we'll call uh, V1 of R and V2 of R of Poisson, right? So just Laplacian of V is equal to minus rho over epsilon zero. But now I have two solutions, okay? 
what can we say? Well, because we want to check whether our solution is unique, it's natural to consider the difference between these two solutions that we have. So what we're going to do is define a function u, which is just the difference between the two, v1 minus v2. OK? So u obeys Laplace, right? of u, well, maybe I'll just write it cleanly. Okay, it obeys Laplace. Um, the Laplacian of u is equal to zero because this is a linear equation for v. I can just do this combination here. The right-hand sides vanish. Okay, that's it. Okay, now, <coughs> Let's just plug u in green 1. OK, so I'm literally just saying that I'm going to choose now the scalar function u to be phi and psi. OK, all the same thing. So phi is equal to psi is equal to u. So what does that tell me? It tells me that the integral over the volume of u times the Laplacian of u plus the gradient of u, gradient of u squared, yeah, I, I mean, I can, that this thing here is equal to the integral over the surface dA of just u times du d normal coordinate. OK? The right-hand side vanishes for you obeying either u evaluated at the surface is equal to 0, or the derivative normal to the surface of u at the surface is equal to 0. OK? And now again, famous, uh, you know, great opportunity for two more people to become famous. So here, this one we call Dirichlet. B-I-R-I-C-H-L-E-T. That's an E, right? I mean, completely clear. Okay? And this is Neumann. Okay? Not von Neumann. Neumann. Different people. Yeah. Okay? Now, if we go back to our equation here, this term here is just 0 by Laplace. OK? So if u obeys Dirichlet, or Neumann at each boundary, or, you know, at the boundary, then what I get from Green's first identity is that the integral throughout the volume of grad u mod squared is equal to 0. OK? <clears throat> So, really, what, uh, 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 what I have in this thing is that I'm integrating something mod squared. So the integrand is strictly positive. 
throughout the space. So the only way that this can be fulfilled is if itself the gradient of u is equal to zero everywhere. Okay? <clears throat> and u is thus a constant. Okay? <clears throat> so you see, v1 and v2 can at most differ by a constant. But this constant is immaterial for the value of the electric field. And this constant can be set by giving me the value of the potential at some point, and then we're done. OK? So that's the statement here. Uniqueness theorem. OK? The solution to Poisson's equation is unique. Or, you know, maybe I, I'll write it precisely like in the, uh, in the notes to make sure that it's all okay. The solution to Poisson's equation um, inside a volume V bounded by a surface S okay connected disconnected I don't care this is unique provided V obeys either Dirichlet or Neumann uh, boundary conditions on S. Okay? <clears throat> That's it, okay? This contains all you ever need to know about essentially the solution to Poisson's equation, the conditions under, under which you can actually uh, 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 find them. I mean, you can know more details and stuff, but, uh, uh, but that's all you really, in principle, need to know. Question? Uh, no, bec uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So um, um, I should use a curly V here, bad notations. The volume V has a Poisson equation, the Poisson equation being Laplacian of potential V is equal to minus rho over epsilon zero. So I'm sorry, distinguish the volume V and the potential V. Okay, so this is really like volume V, yeah? You get my point. OK, so uh, maybe uh, a little um, warning. So uh, uh, Griffiths in the book states that there are many uniqueness theorems. Okay, so, and this is why I want to uh, tell you about uh, my invention of uh, last week, which is the following theorem, which is the uniqueness of uniqueness theorems, theorem. Okay, so, uh, uniqueness of uniqueness theorems th 
theorem's theorem. Okay? Quite simply stated, there is only one uniqueness theorem. Somebody's happy about that. That's great. Okay. Okay, so do not be misled. It is not that you need to learn countless different uniqueness theorems. There is a single one coming from this kind of slightly derivative but nonetheless very direct reasoning from Green's first identity that shows you the conditions under which you can always find a solution uh, to uh, Poisson's equation and this solution will be unique. So once you've found it, you're done. Now, I, I just want to give you a little bit of an intuitive uh, picture of this. So intuitive pick in 1D and then we'll have a break. So intuitive picture in 1D. So what are we doing? Let me consider a one-dimensional uh, problem, but now I have uh, two boundaries, left and right. Okay, And I imagine that what I'm plotting on the vertical axis is the value of the function v as a function of x. Okay. Now, we know that in the bulk, the only thing that we can do is have a straight line. That's all we can do. Now, I could give you Dirichlet boundary conditions at the boundary. I give you the value of the function at the boundary. And now I ask you to solve the Laplace equation in the bulk. Well, you just draw a straight line between the two. I mean, it's kind of a solution, but, you know, close enough. Okay? A few charges, uh, like uh, here, but no, that wouldn't even work. Straight line. So that's Dirichlet. Dirichlet. On the other hand, I could tell you I've got my boundaries, but now what I'm telling you is the value of the derivative of the function at the boundaries. So I'm telling you there's, uh, there's this derivative on this side, and on this side I need this derivative. Okay? I'm telling you the derivative. So I'm giving you Neumann boundary conditions. But I'm not telling you the value of the function. Right? Therefore, what you can do is adjust the value of the function so that the derivatives can match. Okay? So you just line up, you just line up the, uh, 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 the two so that they match. Okay? But you see, yeah, so, so you just have to line them up. Well, straight line. You see, you see what I mean. Okay? Maybe I'll just like remove this for posterity. Okay, so that's just to give you an intuitive feeling of when solutions can exist. Okay, so if these things like, uh, like work out, you can find uh, a solution. If not, then, uh, then you can't. Okay, so you could give me incompatible boundary conditions. Okay, what we've proven here is that the solution is unique. We have not proven that the solution exists, which is a slightly more subtle problem. You see, for example, here... If I give you two values, you will always find a solution. But here, if I give you two derivatives, then maybe there won't be a solution, because maybe the derivatives mismatch. Right? They have to be the same. Okay? If I gave you Neumann and Dirichlet, you would always find a solution. Okay? And that's just the 1D case. In higher dimensions, it becomes a little bit more complicated. But nonetheless, one can sit down and just write down all the cases where this works. Okay? So this, this is like to, to set things in stone, actually. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, now you know. Okay? So let's take a break and then go to practical matters in the second hour.